Hello. Today, let's talk about Jesus Christ's Inauguration Day. An inauguration is the formal installation of someone chosen for an office. It is the day of new beginning. It often is accompanied by an address that indicates the official's plans for the future. Now, this Inauguration Day is recorded in the Gospel of St. Mark, the first chapter, verses 4 through 11. It is the baptismal day of our Lord Jesus as he steps into the office of Messiah and formally accepts his ministry as Savior of the world. The Word of God teaches us in Isaiah chapter 46, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not yet been done. God declares things before they happen. In this case, the coming of the Messiah, it has already been declared by God for centuries through the words of the prophets. God foretold the coming of His Son and the saving work that He would do as Messiah. Now, at His inauguration, His baptism, God declared Christ's purpose and once again foretold what the Messiah would do in His office as Savior of the world. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist had invited guests for the inauguration. John's invitation was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. John's baptism prepared people to repent and to receive a washing of God's forgiveness. In this way, John was gathering a cleansed and repentant people to meet their Messiah. In this Gospel reading, Christ's inauguration ceremony has at least five parts. Here they come. Part 1. John introduces the Messiah. Mark chapter 1, this is verse 7. John says, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Now that may not sound like a great introduction to you, but it was a very direct reference to something that God's Word had already declared. In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, ah, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock in his arm. He will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the nursing ewes. One mightier than John is coming. He will be a mighty warrior. He will do battle with their worst enemies and defeat them. You may think that John was talking about Egyptians or Babylonians, but through John, God was speaking about some other enemies. Temptation, failure, sin. Christ would defeat them. He would also triumph over punishment, death, and the devil. His mighty arm would overpower all of these dreaded enemies. At the same time, Christ would be a shepherd whose arm would gather his lambs as a shepherd loves and cares for his sheep. That was not a bad introduction. But part two, John was not yet finished. The baptizer continued, Mark 1, now verse 8. <clears throat> John said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now that would get the people's attention, I think. The newly inaugurated Messiah would pour out upon them the Holy Spirit. That too was a reference to a promise that God had made before, this time through the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. I am the Lord your God, there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame, I will, and it will come about that I will pour out my Holy Spirit upon all mankind. Sons and daughters, young and old, 
all were to receive the Holy Spirit. And John said that this would happen through the baptism of the Messiah. He would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. We know this to be true. For after the crucifixion and resurrection, th through our own holy baptism, we were born again by water and the Spirit. And the old self died in a death like his, and a new self was raised in a resurrection like his. Our sins were forgiven in the waters of holy baptism, and we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Please see Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. Having heard John's introduction, I'll bet the people could not wait to see their coming Messiah. Filled with power and might, offering kindness and love, pouring out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow! They must have wondered, what will he be like? What will he look like? <laughs> will he be tall like King Saul? Will he be handsome like Absalom? Will he be forgiving like Joseph? Or wise like Solomon? Will he be man of war like King David? or defeat our enemies like the Maccabees. Surely, they thought, they would be able to pick him out in the crowd. Where is he? Is he nine feet tall, wearing robes of silk, surrounded by mighty warriors? Where is he? Part 3. Enter Jesus. Finally, he arrived. The one they all had been waiting to see, finally, the Messiah, took his place at the inauguration. But he was not at all what they had imagined. He was not so very tall, and he was not handsome. No, he had no silk robes. He didn't even bring any warriors. This Jesus was not at all what they had expected. Then, oh my, what did he do next? He waded into the water, just like everyone else, into the waters for the forgiveness of sins. Those waters were for the washing of filthy people with diseases of the soul. You know, hatred, unforgiveness, desire, envy, stealing, slander. Those waters were filthy with every kind of sin, filthy with the sins of all those filthy people. But there he was, the Messiah, on his in inauguration day, right down there in the muck with all those people being baptized. It just didn't seem right him down there with all the rest of them? No, in a moment, a voice out of heaven would declare that somebody was very pleased. You see, the Messiah had long been prophesied before the day of this baptism. The word of God in Isaiah the prophet, chapter 53, had promised that the Messiah would come in just this way. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. What God had promised through Isaiah was now being fulfilled. John called him the Lamb of God. He was without sin, but he would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. God foretold that he would do this. The Messiah would take away all of your sins. He would be crucified and raised from the dead, and he would do that. For all humanity, he would do that for you. Part 4, a special guest Mark chapter 1, now verse 10, tells of an unexpected special guest at the inauguration. And immediately coming up out of the water, he, Jesus, saw the heavens opening and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. The heavens were opening. Now that's a noteworthy Greek word. The word in Greek is schizo, which means to tear apart or to rip open. This, too, was foretold by Isaiah the prophet, now chapter 64. O oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, rip them open, and come down, that the mountains might quake at thy presence. Yes, the heavens were ripped open at the baptism of Jesus, 
and the normal barrier that separated heaven and earth was torn apart. One, I suspect, could look right up into the holy place of heaven because then the third person of the Holy Trinity became visible. God the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and came to rest upon the Messiah. Now, that was a special guest. What did the Holy Spirit look like? The Bible doesn't tell us precisely, but he was visible. The eye could see him. Was he made of light? Did he have a certain shape? What did the Spirit of God look like? All that we know is that he came down as a dove would descend, and he lighted upon Jesus. Also, that preposition that's used indicates that the Spirit may have come upon Jesus, or he may have come into Jesus, but this fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah had declared in chapter 61. Jesus quoted these words about himself. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives. One reason that I think the word schizo, torn apart, is so noteworthy is because it's the same word that's used later when Jesus dies on the cross. Then the veil of the temple was torn apart, schizo. That veil, by the way, was embroidered to look like the heavens. Isn't that interesting? The heavens were ripped open when he began his ministry, and they were ripped open again when Christ was crucified and died. He took the sins and punishment of the world, the veil of the temple was torn apart, and Jesus opened the way to heaven for all believers. Part 5, the inaugural address. At last it was time for the inaugural address. You may have expected the Messiah to speak. But no, it was God the Father who addressed the inauguration. All three persons of the Holy Trinity were there, Jesus in the water, the Spirit descending upon him, and the Father's voice from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, said the Father. In thee I am well pleased. The Father was pleased with his Son, who had identified himself with the sins of humanity and would take the penalties of death and hell in order to open heaven for all who believed in him. The Father and the Son and the Spirit all knew the end before the beginning. Here, at the inauguration of the Messiah's ministry, they all knew the sacrifice of the cross that stood before him. Conclusion An inauguration is the formal installation of someone into an office. It's a day of, of new beginning. It often is accompanied by an address that may indicate the official's plans for the future. Such a new beginning took place at the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. What was to come had already been declared by God throughout the Old Testament, but for the benefit of all who were present and for the benefit of all who were to come. God declared once again the purpose of Christ's divine office. The words and the actions on this baptismal day were a foretelling of what the newly inaugurated Messiah was going to accomplish as Savior of the world. He would be a mighty king, and he would be a gentle shepherd. He would give the Holy Spirit to all who were baptized in him. And though he was without sin, he would join himself to sinners like you and me. He would take our sin and our death, and in exchange he would give us his forgiveness and his eternal life. Through Christ, the heavens were torn apart, and a way into heaven was opened for all who believe. As his ministry began, the Father looked upon the Son and declared, you are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And now, the earthly ministry of the Messiah is finished. 
now by grace through faith in the Savior of the world, God looks upon you and upon all who believe. And the Heavenly Father declares, You too are my beloved one. In you I am well pleased. Amen. Oh